This is CBC Here and Now. Well, this is day one. Wearing the mask and following everything is important to make sure, you know, uh, everybody stays safe. We're not in New York City, right? No, I feel very safe. Everybody's been careful. Newfoundland has been careful, so I think it's time. Yeah. Time to travel. Ready or not, Newfoundland and Labrador joins the Atlantic bubble. The issue we have is that there's no safeguards at the points of entry. What other measures are we taking here within this, uh, within our own jurisdiction to make sure that uh, we, we mitigate the risks of, uh, of, an, of a COVID outbreak? But not everyone is on board, including the opposition. And there are no cars on Water Street. It's also the first day of the pedestrian mall here in downtown St. John's. I'm Heather Gillis, and I'll have more on that story ahead tonight on Here and Now. Food Fishery finally opens tomorrow. We'll have that forecast. Break that down for you in your full weekend forecast coming up in a little bit. Welcome to Here and Now, I'm Carolyn Stokes. Well, it's a big day for travelers. The Atlantic bubble is officially in effect, meaning you're now free to move between the Atlantic provinces without the mandatory 14-day isolation period. At St. John's Airport, there are new protocols in place. The terminal is open to staff and travelers only. Pickups and drop-offs are asked to stay outside. Masks are also mandatory. The CBC's Andrew Hawthorne was at the airport to see how travelers are coping on day one. It's the first day of the Atlantic bubble and you're you're on the first flight out of here. Uh, why are you uh, so eager to get on the plane? I want to see my mom. My, my mom's 97. She lives by herself, so haven't seen her in quite a while. And my four grandkids, uh, you know, which I haven't seen. So more family related. It was a good flight. Uh, everybody wore a mask and uh, did the protocols that were asked of them that I could see. Yeah, you felt safe the whole time? Yes. How do you feel about the provinces opening up right now? I have a daughter who's a healthcare worker who's been on the COVID line, so I take the threat very serious. And wearing the mask and following everything is important to make sure, you know, uh, everybody stays safe. What would you like to see going forward? Would you like to see tighter restrictions or continuing opening up of provinces like this? Slowly. If they're going to open up slowly, do it slowly. Well, I'm from Newfoundland, but I live in Nova Scotia, so I've seen some friends and family yeah. who I haven't who haven't met my daughter yet. Why, if I may ask, uh, are you traveling on the first day of the Atlantic bubble? His mom passed away, so we're here for a few minutes. I'm very sorry to hear. Thank you. Has it been very stressful during this time? Where yes. Oh, very, very. Yeah. Well, we couldn't get home when she passed. So this is the only time we can get here. So it, it, it's been bad. Do you think that uh, some allowance should have been made to get you here earlier? Oh, yeah, most definitely. I would have loved to get him yeah, home most before. Definitely. What would you like to have seen them do? Just make uh, exceptions. Exception. Yeah, like you take all these, use the same precautions, but just in these cases, you know, have, have a family member fly home and, and use the, you know, all the precautions and you know, simple. Well, the opposition is raising red flags about safety at the borders and in public places. There's no reason why we couldn't have looked more uh, vigilantly at testing at the points of entry to ensure that there are no way that the virus could get in here and that those residents who are coming here as visitors uh, would have the freedoms then to travel around our province because they wouldn't be a risk to anybody. I think the province has done a very good job of uh, stressing the, imp uh, the importance of taking precautions against COVID-19, but I don't know, I think they need to do a better uh, communication piece and precaution piece around the Atlantic bubble and also a potential uh, national bubble. But the health minister says the province is taking precautions and that testing for COVID-19 at the border is far from foolproof. The only test we have approved for COVID is actually a diagnostic test. And as Dr. Fitzgerald has said, now that our prevalence is actually so low, there are inherent risks in using that, principally that you will get a test that you're negative when you're actually not. And that she is more worried about. Uh, than really the opposite. Uh, quite frankly, the use of that test is designed to pick up uh, uh, the answer to the question, do you have COVID-19, not are you at risk of it? So it's not a very good test in a screening situation. 
And Peter Cowan had a deeper conversation with the opposition about its concerns. That conversation and more from Health Minister John Hagee in about 25 minutes. And of course, those concerns are felt by others in Atlantic Canada. After months of border restrictions, some are hesitant to travel, fearing this extended bubble could lead to a rise in COVID-19 cases, while others can't wait to hit the road. Here's the CBC's Kayla Hounsel. On Prince Edward Island, the lineups started as soon as the clock struck midnight. With daybreak, they were even longer. We've been in the lineup now for, oh, an hour and 39 minutes. As hundreds tried to make their way into neighboring provinces. Going home to see my mom, haven't seen her since uh, pretty much Christmas, so she's 87. I'm very anxious to visit. The travel restrictions have been eased, but the provincial boundaries look more like borders than ever in an effort to make sure COVID-19 doesn't spread. The rules are a little different in each province, but all travelers are required to show proof of residency. No one seemed to mind. It's a relief for us. But not everyone is happy about the bubble. On Prince Edward Island, someone previously left this nasty note on a car with an out-of-province license plate. In spite of what you may have read, you're very welcome here. So today, the Premier was out on the Confederation Bridge doing damage control in an effort to avoid any bubble trouble, along with a PEI welcome. I believe there's been some isolated incidents, of course, which I don't think has been uh, in, in line with what we normally do here in Prince Edward Island. I think uh, so much unknown has caused some fear and anxiety amongst islanders. There's been opposition in Newfoundland and Labrador, too, with nearly 15,000 signing a petition to keep the border closed. But when the doors opened today, those arriving on the first flight in were grateful. His mom passed away, so we're here for a few minutes. There are currently six active cases of COVID-19 in the entire Atlantic region. For that reason, many say they support the Atlantic bubble, but don't want to open to the rest of Canada. Oh, <laughs> I hope not for a while. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. I don't feel safe. I wouldn't travel anywhere else. The Atlantic premiers say they'll wait to see how visiting neighbors goes before welcoming the country. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Well, another big debut today, the new walkable Water Street. Almost four blocks of the street in downtown St. John's will be closed to cars from noon until 10 o'clock every night. It's something politicians and many business owners hope will boost business. Here now is Heather Gillis is live tonight. So Heather, what's it like down there right now? Well, Carolyn, it is a little bit chilly, but that hasn't stopped people from coming out. You can see people walking their dogs, people running, bikes, skateboards, you name it. Uh, there are uh, tons of people down here this evening. And of course, like you said, this is good for business because no question uh, the last six months has been hard for business. It started in January with Snowmageddon shutting businesses all across the city in Northeast Avalon down for days. Then came the COVID closures. They lasted for months. Tonight, there's a little bit of hope and a lot more foot traffic here on Water Street. Two, one. It's official. Water Street from Prescott Street to Adelaide is now pedestrian only every day from noon until 10 at night. There'll be no cars on the road during those hours, but vehicles will be allowed in in the mornings for deliveries and curbside pickup. The last time the city had a pedestrian area like this was in 1969, nearly 50 years ago. Mayor Danny Breen remembers it fondly. I remember being down here with my father when I was seven years old. The last time this was done. Breen says residents wanted a car-free zone to walk, and he says it'll support businesses that struggled through Snowmageddon and through COVID-19 closures. Restaurant owners and bar owners are telling me that this is going to really help them in the recovery part. Uh, the, the retail owners, uh, by having more people downtown, be a benefit to them. Businesses need our support. They need the support of the local people in St. John's and surrounding areas. One of the things that St. John's lacks, like every capital city has a sort of a central mall or uh, some city center that people can wander around in. 
This morning was a flurry of activity, with restaurants still constructing decks to accommodate more diners and social distancing. St. John's Mayor Danny Breen says the city waived fees for the deck permits and the parking spaces that they're sitting on. He says that'll help many restaurants get closer to full capacity. I'm pretty excited about it. It's being called the Pedestrian Mall, and Merchant Tavern co-owner Jeremy Charles says it's a positive thing. And something that we can continue to do years to come. I mean, uh, I spent a lot of time in Montreal and Chicago and all these great cities that, you know, you're able to get out on the deck and, and uh, you know, enjoy the, the outside. Some retailers are also counting on it to bring more people into their businesses. I'm hoping it will mean increased sales. That is the bottom line. You know, we have to make money. <laughs> I think it will be increased. I think the fact that we'll bring people to in front of my door, in front of my windows, and, I, you know, and come down. Because as I say, we have so much to offer in the downtown. But not all are happy about changing away from cars. Newfoundlanders, uh, particularly townies, like to go and park right next to the place they're going to go in. Some business owners who didn't want to be interviewed worry reduced parking will mean reduced sales. But Galen Gulliver with Downtown St. John says most are on board. She says 80% of members surveyed were in favor of some sort of pedestrian zone. It's really exciting to have that level of support. Still, Mayor Breen says they'll address complaints as they arise. We put this together very quickly and uh, with that we understood that there was going to have to be modifications made as we went. Now, Mayor Breen also says if this pedestrian mall is successful, then city the city will have to uh, approve some longer term plans to make some of the changes down here a little bit more permanent. Of course, this pedestrian mall is going to be here until September 7th and city staff is going to be down here to remind people to keep their social social distance. Carolyn. Thanks so much, Heather. That's here now's Heather Gillis reporting live from Water Street in downtown St. John's. Well, RNC chief Joe Boland says he'll stand firm in the face of what he calls an attempt to discredit and impair his leadership. The chief issued a lengthy statement this afternoon after the results of a non-confidence vote in his leadership were leaked by a former officer. Boland says the vote is a misguided attempt to intimidate and coerce he says he'll have more to say as the process unfolds. Retired officer Tim Buckle, who left the force under a cloud of controversy, tweeted today that 90% of the officers who took part in that vote expressed a lack of confidence in the chief. According to Buckle, 76% of the officers took part. The RNC Association has refused to comment on this. Buckle and Boland have a long history of friction, with Buckle often taking jabs at his former former boss on social media, Boland says he does not plan to step down. Well, to Mount Pearl now, where the deputy mayor is defending a decision to dismiss two city councillors this week. He's not sure when taxpayers will see for themselves the evidence that led to the decision, but says it will vindicate council's actions. Rob Antle has the details. It's been a turbulent week here at Mount Pearl City Hall. Today, the deputy mayor is trying to calm the waters, explaining why two councillors were dismissed earlier this week, saying they had no choice. We had to act like these were serious allegations. Allegations that sparked action at this council meeting. Andrea Power and Andrew Ledwell removed from office, accused of conflict of interest in the Steve Kent harassment investigation over messages sent through Facebook. The intent of the messages was to strategize, to undermine the process, and to, uh, to work to influence uh, decisions of council to ensure that Mr. Kent was returned into his position. He says the messages were on a city-owned device falling under the city IT policy, and the controversy will settle down when they're revealed. Once the public is, uh, is given access to the same information that council used to arrive at this difficult decision Tuesday night, uh, I'm, I'm I'm confident that the public will understand why council was obligated, was obligated to make the decisions that we made. But that's not happening right now while lawsuits are in the works against the city. Kent, Power and Ledwell have all said they plan to sue. Next up, a change in venue as this political battle becomes a legal one and moves from here at City Hall to Supreme Court. Rob Antle, CBC News, Mount Pearl. 
Well, it's another day with no new cases of COVID-19 in this province. We've made it more than five weeks without a positive test. But of course, things aren't back to normal. Some people are still feeling isolated and others are feeling trapped. Women's groups say there has been a dramatic increase in the intimate partner violence during the pandemic. And early on, advocates renewed calls for a dedicated domestic violence hotline. Well, that line went live this week, three and a half months into the COVID crisis, much too long, according to critics. The number is one 709 Anyone experiencing violence can call or text the number on the screen and be connected with nearby transition houses or other services like women's centers and police departments. Well, if you see someone illegally dumping, police in the province want you to report it. Offenders could face steep charges under the Environmental Protection Act. A 69-year-old man from Stephenville is learning that lesson. He was charged with illegal dumping after leaving this mess behind. Around 4 a.m. Sunday, RCMP in Bay St. George got a call that someone dumped all of this on St. George's Avenue. Police investigated, identified a suspect, and issued the man a ticket. According to the province's Environmental Protection Act, individual fines can range anywhere from $500 to $10,000. 51 years ago today, the train, nicknamed the Newfie Bullet, reached the end of the line. On this day in 1969, the bullet made its last trip across the province. It was known for being slow and very costly. The bullet often required government subsidies, but as you'll hear in this report, the old train meant a lot to the people who rode it. Your attention, please. Train number 102, the Caribou. Now boarding for points to St. John's, departing in 30 minutes. The Caribou is the official name, but the train is better known as the Newfie Bullet. Now it's a thing of the past, a victim to paved highways and to Canadian National's new bus system. The Bullet has made its last trip from Port Abbas to St. John's. For the next year or so, it will be available on a standby basis in case the bus service has trouble during the winter. But with this week's trip, an era has ended for Newfoundland transportation. Many of the passengers on the final run were old-timers who had travelled on the train for years. Some are former train employees who have doubts about a winter bus service. I, I think they should be kept on. That's if we get the hard winter. If we get the hard winter, like I've ever seen, the bus is no good. It's not going to get along. If you couldn't get along last winter, could they have a lot of trouble with them? And you don't like the idea either, do you? Oh, no. Definitely not. Well, for us, we're going to miss it as an alternative alternative uh, route. You know, if you can't get on the bus, it was always a train, or vice versa. You'd prefer the bus, though, would you? I prefer the bus, but uh, I still think you should have both of them, the train and the bus. Well, the train is slow, but you can get up and move around. I like to see your sleep, but anyway. I, put, uh, I guess it's too... They're not patronizing, did you see? No money. I mean, if they don't, if they don't uh, patronize it, well, what the hell is just going to take it off, you know? The lack of passengers is the reason for the death of the bullet. Canadian National, which started the bus service last year and has run both buses and trains since then, quotes figures to show that most people prefer the bus, or at least use the bus. Some of CN's own employees feel there is a reason for this. Dining car personnel, 60 of whom are now unemployed, feel the service was allowed to deteriorate. One man who had served on the train for almost 40 years says the dining cars once featured linen tablecloths, silverware, and a varied menu. Now, he says, there are paper placemats, stainless steel, and a limited menu. But CN feels that service in Newfoundland is comparable to that on the mainland. It says the bullet has just fallen victim to changes in modern transportation. Tom Cavanagh, CBC News, St. John's. Food Fishery finally opens tomorrow. We'll have that forecast. Break that down for you in your full weekend forecast coming up in a little bit.
This weather update is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. This year, it's Stay Home Year, the year to rediscover home. Happy Friday, Ashley. Uh, certainly a chilly start to the weekend. And I must say my ears really perked up when I heard earlier today that there's actually a risk of frost tonight. Very important information for all the gardeners out there. Yeah, and you know, there are a lot of new gardeners out there as well. So uh, I called over to Murray's Gardens and uh, talked to Evan there uh, earlier this afternoon just to get a little bit of insight into what to do because most of us, I'm sure, have planted our gardens. Let's take a look at uh, some of that advice this afternoon. He said that uh, the most vulnerable plants are going to be uh, your annuals, your herbs, such as basil, and then veggies, uh, tomatoes, peppers, zucchinis, cucumbers. They don't like temperatures below five degrees. So in order to uh, save them, what you should do is water your plants this evening and then cover them with plastic or even a bed sheet. That'll work as well. And the reason why we do this is because it will help retain the heat that's radiating from that soil close to the plants and then it will protect it from those uh, potential for some frost. Now that potential for frost really is only in low-lying areas as we head through the overnight tonight and uh, you know temperatures much cooler today like uh, Carolyn mentioned only nine degrees is the high today for St. John's same thing through Gander and much warmer though for the south coast and along the west as well 19 degrees in Cornerbrook this afternoon 14 in Carwright and then we've got a temperature near 17 degrees for Happy Valley Goose Bay uh, temperatures currently are sitting in the single digits still about nine degrees for St. John's and then similar temperatures really across the board. Anticipating though, like I said, that these temperatures will drop through the overnight tonight. We saw some showers uh, in the east, they've ended and the skies are finally starting to clear, which is also great news, seeing some peaks of sun now and that will continue to clear as we head through the overnight tonight. And that's really why we do have that risk of frost uh, as those winds stay light overnight tonight with a slight chance of some showers down along the south coast, but it, overall things should clear. Some lightning on the go for Lab West as well. That will continue for the next few hours, and then we should see some clearing as we head towards the morning hours and a more increasing cloud along the south coast and eastern areas of Newfoundland. So overnight tonight, like I said, those temperatures will dip into the single digits for um, most of us. Lower lying areas looking at maybe three, four degrees. And again, because of those light winds and clear skies, that's where we'll see that risk. Otherwise, uh, cool and light winds up through Labrador as well about nine degrees will be the overnight low in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Now tomorrow, generally going to stay cloudy through the afternoon. We're looking at about uh, some showers possible for parts of central Labrador and again the potential for a few afternoon thunderstorms for Lab West and then for northern areas of the island that's where we'll see that potential for a few uh, showers certainly uh, through the day and then towards the evening hours for Lab West and eventually some clearing skies again towards the early morning hours on Sunday. Temperatures will be a little bit warmer in the east tomorrow, about 12, 13 degrees. Those winds generally 20 to as much as 40 kilometers per hour. Now the food fishery opens tomorrow. It looks like fairly decent weather as far as winds and seas go. Uh, but again, those temperatures will be cooler as we head towards central though, 16, 18 degrees and then warmer along the coast as well. But again, with that potential for some showers up through northern portions of the island. For Labrador, 15 degrees for Happy Valley Goose Bay with a chance of showers, 17 in Lab City, and again, can't rule out the chance of a few afternoon thunderstorms. Now into Sunday, Sunday certainly looking like the best day of the weekend. Some morning showers possible for north and and the Avalon. After that, it's looking like we should see some peaks of sun and then some shower activity expected for uh, the interior and southeastern portions of Labrador. That's pretty much the story as we head into Monday as well. A little less cloud cover though in the east. So temperatures by Sunday will be anywhere from 14 to as much as 19 degrees. But look at what happens in Labrador, finally getting back to that 20 degree uh, temperatures in both Happy Valley Goose Bay and Lab City with plenty of sunshine through the afternoon. Now for eastern areas and St. John's, you're looking at 
Temperatures staying in the mid to high teens as we get into the middle of next week. That's when things will start to rebound. We should hit the 20 degree mark at some point next week towards the end of the week though uh, with sunshine for both Tuesday and Wednesday. And then for eastern uh, or rather central Newfoundland uh, after some fairly nice weather maybe a few showers again on Monday but then Tuesday looking at 21 degrees and sunshine. Wednesday is when some uh, looks like some heavier rain will push in. That's the same for Western Labrador, about 18 degrees. Overnight lows will finally get back into those double digits as well as we head into next week. For Eastern Labrador, 21 degrees, uh, 23 on Monday, and then some showers expected, but uh, temperatures climbing quite nicely back into the mid to high 20s for you on Tuesday. And then for Lab West by Tuesday and Wednesday, looking a little gray, but sitting in the 20, 19, 20 degree range. So I had to share this great shot with you today. Uh, Dwayne Head sent us that shot of some morning mist in Wabush. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. If you have any weather photos to share with us, send to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Just gorgeous. Thank you so much, Ashley. Well, you may soon be able to enjoy your downtown drink outside. The George Street Association says plans are underway to start selling adult beverages in plastic takeaway cups. Let's check in once again with here and now's Heather Gillis, who's live downtown at uh, the Pedestrian Mall. A bit of a gray evening uh, there <laughs> right now. So Heather, tell us uh, more about this uh, new change with plastic cups. Well, Carolyn, it's a plan. It's still in the works. So in addition to this car free zone on Water Street, there could be extensions to decks and bars on George Street as well, allowing bars to sell drinks and plastic cups. That's in the works, though. The George Street Association, of course, working with its 22 members and regulators like the NLC and the province to try to get this plan approved when we were talking to Mayor Danny Breen earlier today. He did give us a little hint about what that may look like, but the NLC does say that there will be no alcohol from George Street brought on to Water Street. And if you are going to enjoy a drink down here, they say that can only happen on any of the patios because this pedestrian mall is not licensed. So here's a little bit of a hint of what that may look like, according to Mayor Danny Breen. I think it's, it, it could look like uh, something in, in, uh, in having some decks extended or having some uh, 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 seating out into the street. Um, the ability, they have an ability as they do with the George Street Festival to be able to cordon that area off. So uh, those are details that they're working out with the different regulatory bodies. Here, don't you move, Heather. Okay. Okay, well, the George Street is. So the George Street Association says uh, there should be some more details on that plan next week if it is approved. And we have some guests with us. What's your name? Sakaroya. Yeah, and what's your name? Tanner. And what have you guys been doing here on the pedestrian mall? Uh, riding our bikes around. How many times did you go back and forth? Like 20. <laughs> is it fun? Yeah, yeah we, we was like here about an hour as soon as. Really? Is this something you uh, would have been allowed to do before, before this pedestrian mall? Nope. Not with the cars. Not with the cars. Yeah. We stay on the sidewalks with the cars, but with no cars, and I guess we can just stay on the street. So are you guys going to do this all summer? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I am. I don't know about them. I, I yeah. am. Awesome. Well, I think we have some uh, pretty happy young people about this pedestrian mall, so I think a lot of people are going to have a lot of fun over the summer here. Carolyn? Hey, I love you. <laughs> Well, let's have a look at this. Terry Lynn Sloan White flew into St. John's this morning and she made it pretty memorable for her grandsons. She arrived dressed as a giant dinosaur, as you can see there. Looks like the boys just loved it. Terry Lynn's daughter and her family live in Torbay. She said she jumped at the chance to come visit as soon as the bubble opened. Thanks so much for sharing that with us.
Today is the first day of the Atlantic bubble, the first day that people can travel back and forth without having to isolate. But is it safe? And is there more the government could be doing to make it safe? Well, we've got two opposition MHAs who are joining us now in order to talk about some of their concerns. We've got Jim Din and David Brazel. Thanks both of you for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. So, Mr. Brazel, uh, let's start with you. Um, what concerns do you have about how this Atlantic bubble is being managed? Well, I mean, everybody was supportive of trying to stimulate the economy, and part of our tourism industry is connected to the Atlantic Canada. And we know residents in Atlantic Canada have done their part to try to keep the uh, curve down and squash the COVID-19. The issue we have is that there's no safeguards at the points of entry, which would indicate whether or not uh, there's proper questioning, uh, if there's other uh, particular restrictions that should be put on an individual coming here. Mr. Din, do you share those concerns that were just raised? What, what's your perspective on this? So from our, our point of view, it, uh, the, uh, the restrictions or the, <clears throat> or the requirements at the border are going to be uh, very important, whether they're coming in via ferry or through the airport. And then there's also within the province. As we now have other people, uh, we have people from other uh, provinces mingling within, the, within our province. What other measures are we taking here within, this, uh, within our own jurisdiction to make sure that uh, we, we mitigate the risks of, uh, of, an, of a COVID outbreak? Is there any evidence, though, that people aren't following the rules? They're not doing the isolation they need to do if they come from other parts of the country? If you're, uh, well, I, I can tell you, uh, we, we have received uh, several emails of people who uh, <clears throat> have disregarded the, uh, the quarantine, uh, who uh, they, they report to us or, or uh, in working conditions. So uh, anecdotal, the most we can say is you need to report this, but there is concern uh, uh, for sure uh, as to whether government is tracking this, I do not know. Uh, but for that reason, people being people, I think it's incumbent upon us to uh, to, to insist on certain measures, whether if, even if it's something as we're, we're, we're going to make mandatory, mandatory or require people to wear masks in indoor situations. We know there's plenty of evidence to suggest that masks actually help, but it, it's about it's about in, uh, ma making sure uh, precautions are taken to protect our own citizens and protect the people who come into this province as well. Mr. Brazel, we've seen PEI implement an online form that people have to fill out before they come into the province, which asks some of that information. Is that the route that you'd like to see taken here? Well, that would be one of them. You know, ideally, if you look at where New Zealand is and some of the other uh, jurisdictions, Iceland, there's no reason why we couldn't have looked more uh, vigilantly at testing at the points of entry to ensure that there are no way that the virus could get in here and that those residents who are coming here as visitors uh, would have the freedoms then to travel around our province because they wouldn't be a risk to anybody. You know, so there's a couple of quandaries here of what we could have done. You know, I would have preferred to see us free up some movement within Newfoundland and Labrador until we were really confident that we could bring in people from outside or we had a system in play that would guarantee safe passage by people coming in that would not be a threat in any way, shape or form of passing on the virus to our own citizens here. So uh, I agree with Jim that we could have taken more precautions, we could have more safeguards in, but there's things we could be doing in Newfoundland and Labrador to stimulate the economy uh, before we open up the uh, borders. And if we're going to open up the borders, have enough restrictions or enough safeguards to protect the people of this province. And Peter, to pick up on what, uh, uh, what David has said, uh, people have, uh, have said, I'm sure David has gotten similar uh, uh, emails and concerns. We've just gotten to level two. We've uh, started to open up the province. We've encouraged, we're encouraging people to move around the province. And it seems like uh, uh, we, we're now moving into, let's, let's, uh, uh, let's do an Atlantic bubble. And there is on the horizon the possibility of opening it up to the rest of the country. So people, I think the province has done a very good job of uh, stressing the, imp uh, the importance of taking precautions against COVID-19, but I don't know, I think they need to do a better uh, communication piece and precaution piece around the Atlantic bubble and also a potential uh, national bubble. Well, thank you very much, both of you, for uh, sharing your concerns with me today. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for having us.
Joining us now to talk about some of those Atlantic bubble concerns is Health Minister John Hagee. So, Minister Hagee, uh, opposition parties say there aren't enough safeguards in place at our borders, that we should be doing more. For example, in PEI, visitors must fill out an online form prior to arriving. They're asked about the recent travel, whether they have any symptoms. Why aren't we doing all of that? Well, we actually are. Uh, the only difference is that our form is paper-based uh, and not yet online. Now, the department yesterday said that we're just asking people uh, for two pieces of ID and their contact info. So has anything changed? Are we looking for more information from people when they come? Yes, so the, the form is somewhat more comprehensive than that. It's a declaration that they are, have traveled healthy, that they have um, uh, met the criteria in terms of uh, not being exposed to COVID and not traveling while unwell. There are guidelines there about how to access our COVID information uh, for further education if they need it. And then there's a space for contact information. Okay, and what about the idea of actually testing people for COVID at the border? I know there's been a lot of talk about this. Uh, places like Iceland and New Zealand, they're swabbing uh, all their visitors. Wouldn't that be a safer thing to do here? We've had these discussions with uh, actually Mr. Brazel and Mr. Din for some considerable time because they both sit on the joint all-party uh, public health committee. But one of the challenges is that the test we have for COVID, the only test we have approved for COVID, is actually a diagnostic test. And as Dr. Fitzgerald has said, now that our prevalence is actually so low, there are inherent risks in using that, principally that you will get a test that you're negative when you're actually not. And that she is more worried about uh, than really the opposite. Uh, quite frankly, the use of that test is designed to pick up uh, uh, the answer to the question, do you have COVID-19, not are you at risk of it? So it's not a very good test in a screening situation. What about even just taking someone's temperature? The same issue. Uh, the work that was done on that actually was done around SARS. Uh, and the, the resident who did the definitive paper is now actually Canada's chief medical officer of health. Um, there is no substantive body of work that shows that taking anyone's temperature uh, actually detects COVID-19 uh, of itself. And it's not just the opposition parties who have concerns about this. We've heard lots of people say that uh, they think we're not ready for an influx of people. What do you say to people who feel this just raises the risk of reintroducing the virus here when we're doing so well? Well, I, I would say thanks to everybody because that's why we are doing so well. But the hard work, the good work that's been put in, has been to enable us to return to a much less restrictive life than we've had before. Uh, our plan is NL life with COVID, not hiding away till COVID goes away, because COVID will not go away. Uh, and uh, we have to learn how to live with it. The Atlantic provinces are geographically nearby, and their uh, disease is pretty, pretty much like ours. They have very low incidence of disease, very low prevalence, and this is the next safe step to opening up our province. All right. Well, Minister John Hagee, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Carolyn.
Welcome back to Here and Now. CBC NL hosted a conversation about a new collection at the rooms last night. It's called What Carries Us? Newfoundland and Labrador in the Black Atlantic. The exhibit traces and highlights this province's black history as a crossroads for shipping goods and enslaved people. The conversation was hosted by the curator of the exhibit, Bushra Junaid, and Mun Professor Sonia Boone. Here's part of it. One of the um, items in the exhibition, or one of the discoveries that came about through uh, residency that I did at the rooms was the recognition that the, the rooms in their collection has um, the remnants of a young black uh, uh, sa sailor that dates from uh, the early 1800s, and that was discovered through uh, erosion coastal erosion in the late 1980s. So this particular discovery really talks to, for me, to the role, the significant role that Africans played in uh, all manner of seafaring in the age of sail. So that's one element of the exhibition as well. I've got a poster which talks about the, um, the, the debates that happened in the British Parliament around the early 1800s when there were debates, uh, debates around abolishment about the impact that abolishment would have on the Newfoundland, Newfoundland economy. Uh, you know, examples of textbooks and uh, runaway slave ads, all those kinds of things which talk about the historical black presence in Newfoundland and Labrador. One thing that also strikes me about what carries us is that it makes central some bits of Newfoundland and Labrador history and identity that perhaps are known, but that are often relegated to a footnote or perhaps not questioned or examined or expanded on. And so we know that, you know, poor quality salt fish was sent to the Caribbean and the good stuff was sent to Portugal. Uh, we also know that molasses and screech both originated in the Caribbean. And so salt fish, molasses, rum, central to Newfoundland identity, and they exist because of this place's relationship to the Caribbean. And they show us that Newfoundland and Labrador is not and has never been an isolated outpost, but was actually central and deeply embedded in global histories uh, of trade. And in these particular instances to histories of, of slavery. Absolutely. I mean, I think the, the, the history is so uh, deep and rich and I think um, opens possibilities for us, you know, seeing one another. So, you know, Newfoundlanders, they know their history really well. They document their history. Uh, but at the same time, um, that the, the story needs to be more fully told. So I really feel that Black history is Newfoundland history, uh, and the, the more and more I delve into it, the more and more I recognize that. But I also recognize that you know Newfoundlanders and Labradorians have their own history of, of uh, exploitation and oppression, and um, I, I we're also part of this uh, colonial enterprise, right? So. Uh, on the one hand, you had these, you know, the poor uh, fisher folk, and then, and then in the Caribbean, you had, uh, you know, my relatives who were enslaved, working on sugarcane plantations uh, to keep this engine going, right? So um, I feel that, you know, it will allow us, by knowing the history and, rec and, and not erasing <laughs> half of the history, it allows us to, to come together and to see one another and more fully understand one another. Well, looks like a fascinating exhibit. Again, uh, that exhibit is called What Carries Us? Newfoundland and Labrador in the Black Atlantic. It wasn't open very long before the rooms had to close due to COVID-19. So the exhibit is now being extended into the fall.
Time to find out who's celebrating. Happy 50th wedding anniversary to Rodney and Mary Ingram of Lewisport. Happy 58th wedding anniversary to Chesley and Patricia Carter of Gander. Congratulations to Howard and Rosalind Holmes of Happy Adventure. They're celebrating their 50th anniversary. Happy 58th anniversary to Pastor Max and Shirley Canning of Springdale. Happy 52nd anniversary to Herb and Sherry Primer of Lewisport. Congratulations to Lex and Faye Hudson of Pooch Cove. They're celebrating their 63rd anniversary. Happy 69th anniversary to Randall and Muriel Moulton of Winterland. It's a golden anniversary for Charlie and Judy Lush of Gander. Congratulations to Gordon and Bessie Bartlett of Kippens who are celebrating their 66th wedding anniversary. Congratulations to Gerald and Joyce Hannum of Lewisport. They're celebrating 61 years of marriage. Wishing Marty and Effie Hannaford a happy 53rd anniversary. Happy 53rd anniversary as well to Jack and Clara Joyce of Cornerbrook. Happy 58th anniversary to Mike and Madeline Thompson. Anniversary greetings going out to Alexander, better known as Sandy, and Nita Jones of Indian Bay, who are celebrating 62 years together. Wishing a 58th an wedding anniversary to Alicia and Ben Carey in Cornerbrook. Happy 60th anniversary to Joseph and Ida Cull in Gander. Happy 50th wedding anniversary to Milton and Mabel Reed of Miles Cove. Wishing Martha and Gordon Randall a happy 61st wedding anniversary. Happy 52nd anniversary to Sam and Minnie Norman. Happy 50th anniversary to Doyle and Irene Reed. Congratulations to Eric and May Lomond of Stephenville on their 65th anniversary. Happy 63rd anniversary to Nina and Cecil Thorne of Bayview Twillingate. Happy 57th anniversary to Max and Elizabeth Mercer of Shearstown. Happy 61st anniversary to Edgar and Wavy Penny in Mount Pearl. Frederick and Blanche Thorne of Burnt Islands are celebrating their 51st wedding anniversary. Happy 50th wedding anniversary to Rose and Dave Ivany of Long Pond. Happy 54th anniversary to Rosalyn and Gordon Cram of Old Perlican. Wishing James and Catherine Tarrant of Kilbride a happy 54th wedding anniversary. Happy 50th anniversary to Mike and Rosemary Finn of Stephenville, now living in St. John's. Florence and Roy Rogers of Lewisport are celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. Congratulations. Alonzo and Lucy Stride, also in Lewisport, are celebrating their 52nd anniversary. Happy 53rd anniversary to Frank and Daphne Perry of Phillips Head. Happy 61st wedding anniversary to Percy and Sarah Collins of Hare Bay. Anniversary greetings to Betty and George Badcock of Gambo. They're celebrating 51 years together. Happy 55th anniversary to Roland and Mary Burke from Victoria. Happy 60th wedding anniversary to Lloyd and Jeanette Osmond of St. John's. Happy 50th anniversary to Pat and Betty Aylward of Port Kerwin, Southern Shore. Happy 51st wedding anniversary to John and Elaine Spurl of Hodges Cove. Happy 51st wedding anniversary to Carl and Annie Lush of Burlington. Wishing Milligan and Violet Chapel a Virgin Arm a happy 65th wedding anniversary. Wishing Lorne and Verna Moss of Eastport a happy 63rd anniversary. Happy 50th anniversary to Tony and Ursula Gesso. Happy 92nd birthday to Emma Boone from Labrador City, now living in Lewisport. Birthday wishes to Harvey Ellsworth of Carmenville, who is celebrating his 90th. Best wishes to Vera Cashin on her 93rd birthday. 95th birthday greetings to Mildred Canning of Comfort Cove Newstead, now living in Lewisport. Happy 93rd birthday to Eileen Wells from Glovertown, now living in Gander. Happy 95th birthday to Teresa Murphy of Curling, now in Paradise. Happy birthday to Vera Lodge of Catalina, who's celebrating her 90th birthday. Birthday greetings going out to Earl Parrott, who is celebrating his 95th. Wishing Eileen Oak of Springdale, now living in Corner Brook, a very happy 90th birthday. Happy 90th birthday as well to Pauline Payne of Rocky Harbor, now living in Brookfield. And happy 99th birthday to World War II veteran Rod Dion. 
Another fine crowd. Congratulations once again. And I wonder how big of a crowd will be downtown tonight for the opening of the pedestrian mall on Water Street. Four blocks of Water Street will be closed to vehicles until 10 p.m. tonight. So if you're looking for something to do this evening, I'd say that's worth a gawk. Thanks so much for uh, spending some time with us this evening. Peter Cowan will be stepping in next week to host the show as I take a little vacation. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone.